There's something about the name of Jesus. And I hope you enjoyed this opportunity where you could stop and praise his holy and righteous, marvelous and wonderful name. Let's pray. Father, how we love you and how we honor you on today. Your name is better than every name. One day at that name, Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. And so, Father, we stop for a moment and praise that righteous name. Praise that glorious name while we still have a chance. Father, we ask that you be with us as we open the truths of your word so that we might be encouraged, we might be equipped, and we might be enlightened for the days ahead. Thank you for what you're going to do on today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad that you're joining with us in worship today. What an awesome day to be here. We're continuing the series, It's Joy for Me. If you would, join me in Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 19. I want to acknowledge our senior pastor who is getting some much needed rest. Listen, friends, he is with us in the trenches. He is shepherding us and loving us day in and day out. And so we want to acknowledge him for his goodness, acknowledge him for his shepherding, his pastoring, and his loving on each and every one of us. And I want to thank him for this opportunity to share in the word with you this morning. Hope you got it. Philippians chapter 4, verse 14 through 19. It reads this way. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more, I am amply supplied now that I receive from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. The year was 2020, 2010, I'm sorry, and I was doing my usual Saturday running errands. And I entered a store and I saw a family of our church. The son's name was David. David and his mom were shopping. And after talking briefly, I realized her birthday was the next day. I greet them, tell them to tell, their fa uh, tell his father I said hello. As I go through the store, I see David again. I give David one of two bills in my pocket. I have a $10 bill and I have a $50 bill. I reach in my pocket and I give David the $10 bill. And I say, David, make sure you get something for your mother's birthday that's just from you. And David skips off. Now, as I watch David skip off, I am reminded that times are difficult. I have a son who is in diapers and has a daycare bill at the time. And I didn't really consider what the ramifications of giving David that $10 was, but I knew that I wanted to participate in joy and giving even in difficult times. Here in our text today, Paul demonstrates what it's like to have joy in giving, even in difficult times. This fourth chapter of Philippians, Paul has flooded with some of the, some of the best themes, some of the best scriptures, some of the best passages that we know. Several of our memory verses growing up, several of the scriptures that you know and can recite or that you've heard or that people sing about are right here in Philippians chapter 4. What you would not know is that Paul writes this letter from a Roman jail, chained to a guard. Because the theme of the whole book of Philippians is Paul and his joy and the joy of the Lord. He is exuberant. He is excited. He is full of confidence that God is with him even in the midst of difficult times. Anybody in here ever been in difficult times? Listen, friends, I came by to tell you that God is even in the midst in difficult times. He's right there with us. Listen, Paul tells this church at Philippi, thank you for joining me in my trouble. Huh. 
How many of us wish somebody would join us in hardship, join us in trouble? This church at Philippi has showed Paul, not told him, but also they have showed him that they want to join him in his trouble. We've got a God who wants to join us in trouble. He says in trouble, but the word Paul uses here in the original text is partnership, fellowship. What he means is, as the church at Philippi gives to my ministry and the work that God has called me to do, I encourage them with letters like this one. And it's a give and receive kind of relationship. Paul goes on to say that, Philippi, y'all are the only one who I have entered in relationship with. We know that Paul is referring to the Corinthian church. See, Corinth is quite different from Philippi. Corinth is a great city with rich and wealthy people. See me and stop at Corinth and relax and have a vacation. And so the church at Corinth told Paul one time, we're going to give you a check. And somehow the check never got to Paul. But the church at Philippi, they're a poor city. And they put all of their resources together. And they give a offering and bring it to Paul to help him out as his ministry. Paul is showing them what it looks like to have joy in giving, even in difficult times. Friends, Paul wants us to understand that this is a great partnership. He wants us to understand that when we give to God's work, to God's church, and to God's people, we join in partnership with them. And I know you're saying, listen, Pastor Green, this sounds good. I really, really thought you were going to give a Thanksgiving message so we could shout and dance and all that kind of stuff. That's why Gay came and worshiped like she did. What I want you to know is here in Philippians, Thanksgiving is part of giving. Thanksgiving. And God can use us even in difficult times to give to his work, to his people, and his ministry. And I know you're saying, well, how do we do that in difficult times? Well, I'm glad you asked. How, how do we give when it's hard for me to know what's coming next? How do we understand and give when we're in the midst of a global health pandemic? How do we give when we're in the midst of an economic crisis? How do we give when we're not certain about tomorrow? Friends, I don't know what the answers are. I don't know what to tell you, but I do know. I do know who. I do know that God holds tomorrow. I, I know that as the world changes, his word does not. I know that as circumstances change around us, we can count on this God that we serve. Listen, I, I want you to see what it looks like to give and to have joy in giving in difficult times. Check this video out. My name is Coach Robin Gray, and I serve the community through Harmony CDC. I come every Thursday since the pandemic started. My name is Cedric Jordan. I started working with Harmony about 12 years ago uh, when you minister to inmates of those that are incarcerated. We do things like teaching them how to tie ties, how to interview, how to dress, life basic skills. I get sad when I miss a Harmony Thursday because my, my week is thrown off and because I've been doing it so consistently and for so long, I love seeing the people come through in their cars to get the food. My name is Jason Pipkins. I've been a member of Concord since 1989. And this is my wife, Cherish. I've been a member of Concord since 2003. We have three amazing daughters, Jordan, Jaden, and Journey. The, the power of, of giving, I really ex experienced it um, later on. I was in mortgage servicing about 11 and a half years, same company and was laid off. We had daycare going on, car notes, and it was rough, it was tight. During that whole time, we, con we made a decision, and it was an intentional decision to keep giving. We were gonna trust God. He has always given to us, so we were not going to stop giving to the church to help the church do the work of God. The one thing we're also not giving in just our tithes, but we were giving in our time. We were teaching classes about on marriage and sharing our testimony with our marriage. Thinking about being joyful in the giving, that's what's really important and that's what became key because there were moments that I doubted, you know. I'm looking at bills, I'm looking at how much I was still making at the time and you know, unemployment checks, they run out. And that just helped me to, to build confidence in yes, God is gonna give us everything that we need. Because of us giving, every need was met, exceeded. 
around Christmas time, one of the members of couples in our class reached out to me, one of the husbands, and said, hey, we want to buy the kids Christmas uh, toys. We want to pay for their Christmas. I mean, just immediate tears. And I remember that Christmas morning, before the girls opened their gifts, we prayed. And we just let them know these gifts were given to you by God. Uh, mommy and Daddy didn't have the money this year. But that was an amazing morning because I think the girls really realized how faithful God can be to our families. We kept giving of ourselves and pouring out to other people and he poured right back into us and we overflowed and were able to continue growing. Now it's always how can we give, how can we bless somebody else. You never know how your giving is going to affect somebody else or it's going to be contagious and, and help somebody else have that same joy in giving. The joy of giving is just about blessing someone else, brightening their day, and I love that we're able to do that here at Concord through the ministries of Concord or just being a good friend or a, a good family member. Listen, I want to thank them for that testimony. They really have preached the text here. And I just want to take some time to walk through it thoroughly. Three points and I want to take my seat. Joy in giving is profitable. Paul writes that joy in giving is profitable. He shows that in verse 17. Then after that, he says joy in giving is purposeful. He, he walks us through that. And last but not least, joy in giving is full of promise. I want to thank Jason and Cherish Pipkins for walking through this text and showing what it's like to give even in difficult times. Verse 17, Paul writes, not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. Paul begins to move in the text to using business terms or accounting terms. He's crediting, he's accounts. He wants people to understand that it's a transaction. In my current study context, I'm studying leadership, and they said there's transactional leadership, there's transformational leadership. Transactional leadership is when a leader says, do it, you do it, they give you assignment, you give it back. It's a transaction. Then there's transformational leadership that a leader gets involved with your work, with you, and transform you so that you can do the work. And it's not that either or one is better than the other, but when they work in tandem, when they work together, something great happens. And Paul is just trying to see when we enter in transaction with the Lord, he can transform us like never before. And it's profitable. So what is Paul saying? He says, when a business, a business makes a profit when they earn more than they spend. Business makes a profit when they earn more than what they spend. And Paul is just suggesting here that when you give of your time, yesterday we, we fed thousands of cars yesterday at Redbird Mall with, with turkeys and food for Thanksgiving. And that hour, two hours, three hours, however long you committed to serve, although that took time out of your physical account, what it did to your spiritual account is immeasurable. Paul is suggesting here that when you give of your, your, your money, when you give of your treasure, you may take out of Bank of America $10 and put it in the offering, put it in the church's account. But the things that happen in your spiritual account are immeasurable. He's saying, yeah, when you transfer from bank to bank, from Bank of America to Chase, it's the exact same thing that shows up. But when you transfer and God adds to it, when he blesses it, the benefits, the rewards that come with being a part of his account are immeasurable. Joy in giving is profitable. And Paul goes on to say, I don't desire your gift because he realizes it's not really about your gift. It's not really about how much you have to give or how little you have to give because God will bless it. I came by to tell you that I learned that God blesses the giver, he blesses the gift, and he blesses the receiver. Ask the little boy who had two fish and five loaves of bread. He blessed him as the giver. Then God blessed the gift. He multiplied two fish and five loaves of bread. We don't know if he divided and then multiplied, but what we know that it was a blessing and then the crowd that Jesus was preaching to was blessed. Whatever you have to give, God can work with it. There are spiritual blessings attached to giving. I, I, I can't really explain it, but I know that when you give, God credits your spiritual account. And Paul is telling this church at Philippi, listen, friends, 
Thank you for your gift. But more than your gift, I'm more than I'm excited about your gift, I'm excited about what God is going to do because you gave, how God is going to bless you. There's a, a gospel group, one of the greatest gospel groups of our time, and the best female gospel group. They're, they're from the city of Detroit, Michigan. Around town, they're, they're known as Maddie's Girls. Some say they are imitated but never duplicated. We just know them as the Clark Sisters. If you don't know who they are, find out. They, they, their breakthrough album, Is My Living in Vain, their, their leader, composer, musician, El Bernita Twinkie Clark wrote, Is my living in vain? Is my giving in vain? Is my praying in vain? Is my preaching, my fasting, my serving in vain? She goes on to write, No, of course not. And in four-part harmony, they respond, it's not all in vain, but up the road is eternal gain. Because like Paul, she knew that if you do what God calls you to do, if you give of your time, if you give of your talents, if you give of your treasure, there are spiritual blessings attached to you giving to God. When you give to God's church, when you give to God's work, when you give to God's people, he blesses and there is profit. Joy in giving is profitable. Paul goes on to verse 18 and says, I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. The text moves here and joy in giving is purposeful. It's purposeful. Paul introduces us, introduces us to Epaphroditus, and he calls him a fellow worker. He, he says he's a, he's a messenger of the gospel. He's a brother. We don't know anybody else in Scripture Paul works with that he describes with great fashion. What he wants us to know is Paul admires and respects Epaphroditus just like the church at Philippi does. What he really wants us to see is they respect him because he sacrifices. What's the purpose in giving? Is that we sacrifice. Epaphroditus risked his life to get the gift from the church at Philippi to travel all the way to Rome to Paul to give it to Paul and then travel back to Philippi. Do you know what happens to Epaphroditus? He almost dies. He sacrifices his life for the work of the Lord. He sacrifices his life in order to give. He sacrifices his life. Friends, I came by to tell you, giving ought to cause you to sacrifice. If you're giving your time and it's easy for you, you're giving your love and it's easy for you, you're giving your money and it's easy for you, then I came by to tell you you need to do more because it's not a sacrifice. Joy in giving is purposeful and it's so that we might sacrifice and demonstrate sacrifice. God wants to know what our heart is doing. And when we sacrifice, we show him our heart. Then second, Paul says it's purposeful because he says their gifts are a fragrant offering an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Paul moves from using accounting terms to Old Testament worship terms. You'll see these words also in his letter of, to Rome, Romans 12 and 1. I offer my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Paul is telling that church at Rome that you, the way you live, your lifestyle and how you operate and how you transform and not conform is worship. He's alluding to the Old Testament when, when, they were give, when God gave the specifics for the tabernacle, the tent, the temple, the church, the place of worship. The first thing they would do is come into his courts with thanksgiving and praise, and then there would be a place for them to burn incense, to have a sweet aroma set. Well, what does that mean? They were setting the atmosphere for God to worship, for God to show up in their worship. They were setting the atmosphere to God to be in the midst then he goes on to say not only that, but the gift you gave was an acceptable sacrifice. In the temple, not only did they set the aroma and uh, burn incense, but they went further and they presented their best sacrifice. Old Testament, it was a ram, it was a goat, it was the first of their fruit. He had to, the goat or the ram had to be the best, he had to be the healthiest. It was the best and the first and they laid it on the altar and they gave it to God. And only until then could they have the priest go further and talk to God on their behalf. I came by to tell you, Paul is saying, giving is a part of worship. When you give, you set the atmosphere for God to do great things in your life and to show up with his presence in your life. 
When you give, you give out of obedience so that you can get closer to him and he can, you can tell him all about your troubles and he can hear your faintest cry. Giving is a part of worship. It's, it's purposeful. And we ought to do it to please God. What I love is the gift that Epaphroditus brought exceeded Paul's expectations. Came by to tell you when you give, God can exceed your expectations. That prayer you've been praying for him to answer, he can exceed your expectations. The thing you want him to do in your life, he can exceed your expectations. Paul goes on to write, and our last point for the day, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Some versions say, my God will supply all your needs according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Last but not least, joy in giving is full of promise. Joy in giving is full of promise. It, it's, it's, uh, it's profitable, it's purposeful, but it's full of promise. What's the promise that God will supply all of your needs? What's the full part of the promise that God will supply all of your needs? Not only is it full of promise, but the promise is personal. Paul says, and my God. We see this, this vernacular uh, when, we, when David writes in Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. We see that it's personal. I don't know about you, but I, I have some personal prayers that I've prayed to God, and I need him to answer. It ain't about you. It ain't about him answering your prayers. It's some things I need him to answer for me. And so when I pray to him, I need him to be my God to supply my needs. I have an older sibling, and she can't stand the fact when I call and say, hey, I talked to my mama today. I talked to my daddy today. And she's like, do you realize we have the same mama and the same daddy? And I was like, yeah, but there was something I needed from them, and it was personal. Paul is saying here that God's promise is personal. He can supply your needs. And whatever it is, he can do it. Not only is it personal, but it's providential. Why? Because it says he can supply your needs according to his riches and glory. It's providential. I know you're saying, well, Pastor Girl, I don't really like talking about giving because it always makes me feel like if I do this, then God do that. If I don't do this, God won't do that. If I do this, then God does that. If I do this, God does that. It's not conditional. We have to change our mind to thinking that God is a conditional God. Because if he was a conditional God, do you realize how sinful you are? Do you realize how much you missed the mark? Do you realize how often you, you don't make the mark? And he hasn't given up on you, so he's not a conditional God. I, I'd ask you to change your mind and see that he's a cyclical the process of him giving and you giving to him, it's a cyclical process. It's not conditional. What, is, what do I mean? God wants to continually bless you. He wants to continuously grow you. He wants to continuously show you his, his, your, his will for your life. And as you jump into this cyclical process, as you give, he does more. As you give, he does more. As you, as you serve, he does more. As you learn about him, he does more. It's a cyclical process, not a conditional process. It's providential. He wants to give. He wants to answer your prayer. He wants to supply all of your needs. And he can do it. Friends, listen, Paul goes on to say, it's according to the riches of his glory. There's something great about God's glory. It suggests here that his glory extends his grace. What does that mean? When God's glory shows up, then he extends grace. What does that mean? Glory means the glorious presence, the great presence of God. And when the presence of God shows up, he extends grace. When I said we, when they went in to bring their sacrifice and their offering and they set the aroma in the Old Testament, we do that today when we lift our hands, open our mouth and worship him. We bring his glory into our lives, into the atmosphere, into the situation. And when we bring his glory, it extends his grace. So how does he give? He gives according to the glory that we understand about him. So if we don't make him big in our life, if we don't understand all of his grace. Still a cyclical process. The more we make him big, the bigger we make God in our life, the more we allow him to glorify himself, the bigger he becomes, the smaller our problems. 
The larger he becomes, the, the smaller our problems. It's according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. How big do you see God? How big do you see your problems? Th that's why he can take little and make much out of it. Because if we see little, he sees much. And if we trust him with much, he can make much out of it. He can multiply whatever our gift is as long as we give it to him. He gets the glory and we are extended grace. Friends, I found out God blesses the giver. He blesses the gift. He multiplies the gift. And then he also blesses the receiver. So there I was walking around the store and I got to the cash register. I'm so glad that I gave David this $10 bill so he could buy something for his mom. And there was joy in giving. And as I get to the cash, cash register and put my items on the tray, she rings me up and I pull out the money in my pocket and it's a $10 bill. Well, I told you I had a $10 bill and a 50. And if I still had the 10, that means that David had the 50. I had to make some life decisions right there. Do I run and chase David down and tell him, birthday for your mama's counsel, give my $50 back? Do, 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 do I run after him and say, I made a mistake? And I decided in that moment, I got to trust that my God will supply all my needs. I had a, a son in diapers with a daycare bill, and I had $10 to my name for the week. I don't really remember how God did it. I don't know if I used $6 on spaghetti. You know, spaghetti, you know, spaghetti will last you all week long. And $4 in my tank, I don't know if I got sandwich meat and bread and put five in my tank, but I do know that God supplied my needs. But let me tell you what he did that was more. He gave me more. He extended. David's father came to me the next week and said, Pastor Green, listen, I don't really know how you knew that I wasn't going to make it back into town to celebrate my wife. I don't really know how you knew to tell David to get exactly what she wanted. I don't even know how you knew to tell David to put my name and his name on the gift. But just know your gift blessed our family richly and encouraged my wife. Friends, that was the account that I couldn't process. That was the benefit and the reward from my spiritual account by me just saying, I'm going to give a little bit. By me just saying, now I shouldn't have gave that much, but and letting God do the rest. Well, friends, what did I learn? The first thing I learned is to look at my bills when I pull them out of my wallet first. That's the first thing I learned. The second thing I learned is that God blesses the giver, he blesses the gift, and he blesses the receiver. What's the other thing I learned? I learned that there is joy in giving. And it's profitable, it's purposeful, and it's full of promise. But I also learned that my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I hope somebody's encouraged today. Listen, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to give today. I know it's Thanksgiving and you're thinking about receiving all the food and it's a different year this year because there's a pandemic. They're telling us not to gather. Don't you gather? They're telling us all these things and it's different, but I want to challenge you today to give. If you know that your gift that you give weekly or don't give weekly or should give weekly to this church and this family of believers is not what it should be, I challenge you to give today. I challenge you to give to the ministry of this church. I'm telling you, you're giving into fertile ground. I know you say, well, I may come from, a, you may have come from a church where they, they did a building fund and the building never came up. You may come from a church where they embezzle money. You may come from a company and you're not really good on finance, but I came by to tell you it's not about you. It's about giving, letting God bless the gift and the receiver. I challenge you to give today. Maybe you're already a giver. God bless you. Thank you for your gift. Maybe it's not a sacrificial gift. It's not uncomfortable for you to give. I'm asking you to give more. Or maybe you say, you know what, Green? I give to the church and I give more. Then I want to give you two other options to give. Give to Angel Tree. We're supporting kids who have a parent that is absent. We want to make sure they have the best Christmas ever. Give to Angel Tree. That link is going to show up. Then, if you don't want to give to Angel Tree or you already have, give to Harmony. Harmony is no longer just blessing our direct zip code, but we are blessing the city and surrounding cities as God allows us, as he blesses gifts and givers. We're recipients of that. Friends, and maybe you're here today and you want to take this challenge, but you're unsure because you have not made a conscious choice to receive the ultimate gift. That ultimate gift is Jesus Christ. We want to offer you Jesus today. Once you accept him in your heart, 
change the trajectory of your life, change the course of your life, stop leading and allow God to lead your life. All you have to do is click that link in the chat, whichever platform you're on, click that link. Somebody will show you how to accept Jesus in your heart. Maybe you're here today and you've continuously watched us. You're like all of us, you're watching several churches. You're dating on Sunday morning. You're speed dating on Sunday morning. We want to give you the opportunity to join this community, this family of believers so that we can see you grow, we can worship with you, we can grow with you, and we can serve with you. That, that, that's your choice today. Accept Jesus, join this family. Click that link and somebody will help you. Last but not least, before I take my seat, how awesome is it that we can open up God's word be challenged, encouraged, equipped, and enlightened, and then act on it the same day. What are you talking about, Green? I'm talking about we can now worship through our gifts. We can give an offering. So not only did God enlighten us, encourage us, and challenge us, equip us through His Word, but now we can act on it, and now it's time to give. There's a link in the, in the, in the chat. You can click that link and give. You can text the text code and give that way. You can mail in or bring your offering. But today you can act on that. We want to make sure that we give you that opportunity to give. Listen, why do you give? Or what, what way, what, we got the ways you give. How do you give? Why do you give? You give to support the ministry of this church. Because we want to make sure that we're blessing people and we're being a part of the gift and the giver and receiving. And then we also, when you give, you, you support our senior pastor and his family. I tell you, he gives in week in and week out tires, tirelessly so that we might be pastored and shepherd. You can give those ways and support those to the ministry of this church and our senior pastor. Listen, friends, have a happy Thanksgiving. Be safe, be smart, follow all of the guidelines. Listen, our hosts are coming back to give you some instructions and then we'll end with worship. Happy Thanksgiving. Wow, what a powerful message by Pastor Green. Thank you so, so, so much for reminding us how to find the joy in giving. He also gave us a challenge for this week. Were you listening? Which was find an area to give, whether it's giving back financially to Concord, be a blessing to our Angel Tree mission, or give to the community through Harmony CDC. And shout out to Harmony for hosting that Thanksgiving giveaway. We served over 3,000 people yesterday over at Redbird. So shout out to those who came out. For those who have made the decision today, congratulations and welcome to the family. Someone will follow up with you for your next steps. Now, before I let you guys go, I have a couple of announcements. What's that? If you want to be a blessing to a child of an incarcerated parent this season, let us know in the chat. You can get more information about our Angel Tree mission. Also, mark your calendars for New Year's Eve for our Revive God's Not Done experience. But beforehand, we need you to submit your God's Not Done letters to God at ConcordDallas.org backslash prayer dash 2020 for our prayer challenge. We will then pray over your letters during Revive as we head into 2021 because we know this year to have been something crazy for everybody. You feel me? Absolutely. Thank you so, so, so much for watching today, family. We appreciate you. And we'll see you next Sunday at the same time and the same place at 8, 10, and 12. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy make, Thanksgiving, everyone. And make sure y'all don't eat too